Hello. Uh, so people are streaming in. We're going to give it a minute or two before we actually start up. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to check out this webinar. I'll just wait about another minute before we uh, get started. All right, I've got 60 seconds on the clock and then we'll and then we'll start. If you just joined, don't worry, we've not started yet. Yeah, this is Nickelodeon Guts with 60 seconds on the clock. And then later we'll go to Mo on the flow with Mo. Mo. All right, just about there. So, uh, a couple housekeeping things first. If you have a question, please use the Q and A feature in Zoom to ask a question there. Uh, Jeff Dimmick is here with me today, and he's going to be handling some of the some of your questions during the webinar. And uh, any questions that uh, you know that uh, Jeff isn't able to handle, uh, which will, you know, so I'll 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 answer questions at the uh, at the end. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. So you are in the Bloodhound 4.3 announcement webinar. Thank you. This is going to be this is being recorded, and we will be um, you know the recording will be available at the same link that you used to join this uh, today in case you want to share the recording with anybody else. This release is all about getting global admin more often. So let's talk about it. The major updates of this release, we have support for Microsoft Graph attack paths. And I'll talk in detail about each of these. But first, let's hit the major updates. We have more attack paths in Azure Resource Manager or Azure RM. And we have more managed identity attack paths as well. Before we go into the details of each of these, I want to acknowledge some community co-authors of this release. So Bloodhound 4.3 is authored not only by the Bloodhound Enterprise team, but also by these three people from the community. So Hugo, Hugo uh, Vincent, Christian M, and Simone Decos. Um, probably said those names incorrectly, but I gave them my best shot. And you can find those folks at those uh, social media links there. And their particular contributions are also outlined in the announcement blog post if you want to see the details of what each of them is being credited with. And uh, on behalf of the Bloodhound Enterprise team, I do want to say thank you to these three folks for their great contributions to this release. Let's get into some detail. So first and big thing, the headline for this release is Microsoft Graph support. So what is Microsoft Graph? Let's read this together. Microsoft Graph uh, is kind of an API for APIs. It unifies disparate APIs behind this one graph.microsoft.com endpoint. So you can access Azure AD, you can access Office 365 uh, objects through this one unified API. Every single Azure Active Directory has Microsoft Graph instantiated into it uh, as a resource app. This is also known as an enterprise app. It's also known as a service principle. It's also known as a first party app. Many different names, same thing, and it's gonna be everywhere. So it exists everywhere. Every Azure AD tenant has MS Graph. Uh, the way MS Graph works is it brokers requests to particular Azure services. And those requests can include privileged actions like resetting user passwords, adding users to security groups, activating role assignments, adding secrets to service principles, all kinds of fun stuff. So very attractive to attackers. Why do attack paths and MS Graph matter? So where you will see MS Graph app role assignments being very commonly used are with third-party applications. Uh, so third-party applications, they use these to perform privileged tasks 
uh, like managing role assignments. Uh, there are third-party applications that will do like quote unquote zero trust uh, type stuff for Azure AD. And in order for the application to actually do what it needs to do, very commonly, it will do that with an MS Graph app role assignment for its own service principle. So that creates attack paths. Uh, additionally, Microsoft Graph is its very own distinct privileged access model, uh, which is uh, compliant with the model of uh, delegated permissions and app roles that Microsoft makes available to any app publisher. So MS Graph can grant permissions that are wholly distinct from, yet just as powerful as any other Azure AD admin role, including global administrator. And those permissions for MS Graph, those app role assignments, they're not very easy to audit. So Azure admins have a tough time auditing these or really understanding them in the first place. Uh, the app roles are confusing. Uh, they're very commonly overlooked. And it's very common that the impact of those app role assignments are not very well understood. This is a perfect combination for attack paths to emerge persist and get worse over time. So how does Bloodhound help with that situation? Um, so Bloodhound models not only the configurations, it will also model the outcomes of those configurations. And this is the crux of how Bloodhound helps uh, admins or red teamers or anybody. So you don't need to remember the fine grained details of what each of those app role permits because Bloodhound will keep track of that for you. So let's look at an example. Here's the documentation for a particular app role called directory.readwrite.all. So this is on the Microsoft Learn site. And it says the directory readwrite all permission grants the following privileges. Okay, so create and update users. What else do we have on here? Manage group memberships, update group owners. Okay, but then but then there's a note here. So, okay, well, so we can update users, but you can't reset their passwords. Uh, there are certain attributes that you can only update if the target user doesn't have a particular role. There's all kinds of complexity here. And there's also maybe some misleading statements here. So, this app role assignment, it says that it can manage group memberships and update the group owner for a group. This is true, but only for groups that are not themselves role assignable. If the group is role assignable, then this is not true for this app role assignment. Now, all the different app roles for MS Graph are kind of like this, where they have all these little, these little conditions and these little gotchas, and they're pretty confusing. And not only that, but the impact of these app role assignments, you won't see anywhere when you go to audit a group and see, you know, is there a service principle that can update the owner of this group? You're not gonna see that. You, you can't really easily audit that. You can't see the outcome of that configuration. So in Bloodhound, we model not only the configuration. So as an example, here is a service principle that has the directory.readwrite.all app role against Microsoft Graph. We can't use dots for edge names in Neo4j, so they're underscores instead of dots. So this is the configuration. And this is the outcome of that configuration. So this service principle has that app role. And what that enables is all these groups over here which are not role assignable, this service principle has the ability to add an arbitrary owner to any of these groups or add an arbitrary member to any of those groups. And we can see a specific example here. So the service principle has this new edge type, AZMG, Microsoft Graph, add member, and AZMG add owner against this group. OK, now this is good for being able to do kind of like a one off audit of, you know, a group and see who has control of it via some app role assignment. 
or the other way around, a service principle, what we're looking at here is, you know, what privileges does it have outbound to other objects? But where this matters more, I mean, especially for this role, is this group, like I said before, is not role assignable. So that means that this group can't have like the global admin role assigned to it or privileged auth admin or privileged role admin. However, groups that are not role assignable can have role assignments in Azure Resource Manager. And so even if a group is not role assignable, it can still be privileged. And this starts to matter when you start to see attack paths like uh, what I'm going to show you next, which is based on what we've seen in a couple of different customer environments. Like this. So we're going to step through this attack path in a demo, and I'm going to walk you through each of these steps. Um, but before we do that, let me talk about a few more details about some of the other major updates. So the second major update is new attack paths in Azure Resource Manager. So what's the story here? The story is Microsoft is constantly adding new services to Azure RM, which is fantastic. The more services we have, the more options that admins have for doing different compute uh, things in, in the cloud is, is, is good. It's, it's a net benefit for everybody. Um, however, the pace of Microsoft adding those services into Azure RM, it's kind of tough on the security side to keep up with researching the abuse primitives that are enabled by those different services. So on our side, we're striving to keep pace by doing that abuse primitive research because we want to understand not only the current abuse primitives that attackers are using today, which we can all read about in breach narratives, but we also want to understand what are the abuse primitives in the future, which, which abuse primitives are attackers going to find attractive uh, and common um, in the future with all these new Azure RM services coming out. So we are striving on our side to keep up, to catch up with Microsoft on this. Um, and we're, we're, trying our, we're trying our damnedest. So specifically, we now support attack paths that traverse seven different Azure RM services, automation accounts, container registries, Azure Kubernetes service managed clusters, function apps, logic apps, virtual machine scale sets, and web apps. Web apps and function apps are technically from the same uh, provider in Azure, but they work differently enough that it warrants modeling them as uh, distinct types of objects. So the third major update we have are more managed identity attack paths. All seven of those services that we just listed on the last slide, last slide they all support managed identity assignments and they are all abusable when it comes to managed identity assignments, meaning that if you have the right privilege against one of those uh, resources, and if that resource has a managed identity, then you're gonna be able to impersonate that managed identity with a JWT extraction primitive, which we'll demonstrate here in a, in a minute. So managed identities are great for defenders because they eliminate the need to store, fetch, or otherwise manage credentials. So managed identities are fantastic from a defensive perspective. From an offensive perspective, they are extremely attractive because they are one of the very few techniques that you can employ to pivot from an Azure subscription back up to an Azure Active Directory tenant. No matter if the managed identity is a system assigned identity or a user assigned identity, it's gonna track back to an Azure AD service principle. Okay, we are gonna go through an attack path demo just as soon as I have a sip of coffee.
If you have questions, use the uh, Q&A feature, please. Uh, Jeff will do his best to answer those questions. Uh, any questions that remain, I will try to answer to my best ability at the end. So here is the attack path that we were looking at earlier. And I'm going to simplify this down a little bit so that we uh, have fewer things to look at. So this is the attack path that we're going to demonstrate. And I want to zoom in on each step and explain what it means. And then I will demonstrate how we can abuse that particular part of the attack path. We're going to start with this first section right over here on the left. Let's zoom in. So this service principle with this name has a MS Graph app role assignment, which the outcome of that assignment is that this service principle has the ability to add owners or members to non-role assignable security groups, including this one right here. And this group is called non-T0 group. So if this service principle can add members to the group, we're just gonna have the service principle add itself to the group. And what we're gonna be simulating here is kind of an initial breach or assume breach scenario where the attacker has been able to collect a credential for this service principle somehow. And there's plenty of examples out there of how that happens. So we're just gonna say, we're just gonna assume breach and we're gonna assume that this service principle has been compromised. So there are a few things that we need. Um, I'm gonna be doing this attack path demo with Bark, which is a PowerShell script I created. Uh, Bark stands for the Bloodhound Attack Research Kit. And like I said, the service principle is going to add itself to the group. We need the object ID of the group, which is here, and we needed the object ID of the service principle. And so we plug those in to our add AZ member to group. Um, uh, parameters here. First, we need to get an MS Graph token uh, for the service principle. So we'll use Bark's get MS Graph token with client credentials function to do that. There's our JWT for the service principle. Then using that JWT in the token parameter, we will add the service principle to the group and it's done. It's that easy. Um, this API that uh, but the API that this function calls, it doesn't return any output. So the function itself doesn't return any output, but you could check to make sure that your service principle was added to the group with just another simple uh, group enumeration commandlet. Okay, so the first part of the attack path is done. Let's move on. The second part of the attack path, we have a few different options. So this group, even though it's not role assignable, can have role assignments in Azure RM. And we've got three different options. We have uh, an automation account, a function app, and a web app. And the group has the resource specific contributor role against each of those respective objects. We're gonna be targeting this automation account. And so the group has the automation contributor role assignment against that. And now that the service principle has been added to the group, the service principle also has the automation contributor role scoped to this automation account. So this will take a few different steps. Um, first, we're gonna need to get an Azure RM scoped token for the service principle. Uh, we need to do that because we're gonna be accessing a different API besides MS Graph. Um, so that's gonna be as easy as Copying and pasting this. Now we have our token, which is scoped to Azure RM. There it is. And then um, what we're going to do is we're going to define a script, which is going to pull from the automation account IMDS a JWT for the service principle that is associated with the automation account through a managed identity assignment. So that was a lot of words, uh, but what I mean is this automation account has a managed identity assignment against this service principle. Because we can 
basically execute arbitrary commands on this resource, we can fetch a JWT for this service principle and then act as that service principle. Impersonate really isn't the right word because we're, we're doing exactly what this is designed to do. We're just, we're doing an abuse. The ID of this service principle, we do specify in that script um, variable because we need to target that service principle specifically uh, because this automation account actually does have other managed identity assignments. So we have our script defined. We will add a new runbook to the automation account. That runbook is going to execute this script. So there we define the script. Here we are going to add the runbook with that script to the automation account. And I'm going to let this play in real time. So status code 202 is accepted, but processing, I think. And then we're going to fetch the output of that runbook. So it's going to execute the script on the automation account runbook, and then we're going to fetch the output. So this is going to play in real time. So you'll see how long this takes while it's running. More coffee for me. Still running. And there's our output. This is a JWT for this service principle, which was called um, Azure SP Creator Editor, I think. And uh, in the script as well, we're specifying that the resource that we want to have the token scoped to is MS Graph. And we do that because the next step in our attack path is going to be through MS Graph. And so if we wanted to get an Azure RM token instead, we would just specify the Azure RM endpoint in this resource parameter instead. Okay. So this is the next step and final steps in our attack path. This service principle has a app role assignment called service principle endpoint dot read write dot all. That app role assignment allows the service principle to add an arbitrary owner to any other service principle. And there are no restrictions placed on that. So this service principle can, through Microsoft Graph, add an owner to this service principle. This service principle has a different app role assignment. And the app role assignment that this service principle has is called role management dot read write dot directory. One of the outcomes of that app role assignment is the ability to promote other principles to any Azure Active Directory admin role, including global administrator. So we're going to add Azure SP Creator Editor as an owner to this service principle. If you own a service principle, you can add a new secret to that service principle. So we will add a secret to this service principle. We will use that secret to authenticate as this service principle. Then after we have authenticated as the service principle, we will use its ability to grant global admin, to grant global admin to the first service principle we started the attack path as. Our, our very first service principle we started as. And this video will step through what I just said. So here's our token for the Azure SP Creator Editor service principle. We'll add that as a variable uh, for MG token here, which will then pass to the new service principle owner bark function. The 
object ID of the new owner is going to be the Azure SP Creator Editor service principle. And the target service principle object ID, this is going to be the object ID of the intermediary service principle that's between us and global admin. So adding the Azure SP Creator Editor as a new owner of the other service principle is now done. We need to wait a few seconds for that to actually be recognized by Azure on the back end. After that time, we can add a credential to the service principle. The output here will show us uh, the value of that secret. So there's the value of the secret for that service principle. We'll plug that in to uh, uh, the token acquisition function. And we need to specify the, uh, this is gonna be confusing, but we need to specify the app ID of the service principle as its client ID. So I did that too quickly. Um, it takes time for these new for these new secrets to be usable. Um, so we just need to wait a few seconds and then try again. And now we are able to authenticate. And now we have a token for that service principle that can promote to global admin, which is what we'll do now. So we're going to promote our original service principle to global admin using the uh, Bark function, new Azure AD role assignment. We need the ID of that original service principle, which I'll just get from Bloodhound. We also need the template ID of the role, which we can also get from Bloodhound. So this is already plugged in. This is the template ID for the global admin role. And then here's the object ID for the original service principle. That's all plugged in. We will execute this command. And we're done. When we have this, um, when we have this role assignment ID here, uh, this tells us that the role assignment exists now. And our original service principle that we started off as is now a global admin. And so the attack path is complete. Okay. If you are ready to get started with Bloodhound, you can get Bloodhound at bit.ly slash get Bloodhound. I'm going to be talking about Bloodhound Enterprise next. So if you're interested in that, please stick around. I'll leave this slide up for a moment as I have some more copy. Okay, let's talk about how Bloodhound Enterprise helps. So Bloodhound Enterprise will do uh, data collection, scheduling, automation, all that kind of stuff for you. So data collection is kind of set it and forget it with Bloodhound, Bloodhound Enterprise. Once that is all going, the core value, the core feature of what Bloodhound Enterprise does to help with this is it will analyze all of the different connections that exist in the graph, which will number in the millions or billions. And then it will figure out what are the particular connections that are creating the most amount of risk. And the way that that works is we identify the tier zero objects. So the objects that grant full control of the entire environment. We find the connections to those tier zero objects. And then we calculate for each of those connections, how much of the rest of the environment is enabled by an attack path to get into tier zero through that one particular connection. So if you think about an analogy, like think about the driveway in front of your house, the driveway connects to the street in front of your house, but the real connection, the real, the real impact of that goes far beyond the street that your driveway is connected to. There's, I mean, pretty much just one giant piece of asphalt in North America that my driveway connects the entire continent to my house. So we calculate that 
in the graph and understand what is the impact of any particular connection in Active Directory or in Azure. And so what that looks like in the Bloodhound Enterprise interface is, is something like this. So this is a combo node right here, and this represents our collection of, of tier zero assets. And what I've highlighted here is a managed identity connection from something that is not tier zero to something that is. And the risk uh, statement or the risk level that Bloodhound Enterprise has defined this as is moderate, which means that somewhere between half and about 75% of the environment can execute an attack path and get to this point to then breach and get the final step into tier zero. All of those different connections are ranked in that way. And so what you get is this rank ordered list, hit list of remediations that you need to go through. And they rank all the way from critical to low. Uh, what this also will tell you is if we click on this timeline button right here, what you'll see is over time, how has this risk changed? So in preparation for this webinar, you know, I've been making changes in our test environment and the risk has gone up. Uh, because I introduced new configurations, those configurations uh, have impact. And uh, actually, to be honest with you, this was higher than I expected. And it kind of reminded me that these environments are way more complex and way more connected than, uh, than even I can fully appreciate without a tool like this. When you click on this button right here that says view slash export full remediation plan, what you get is a uh, prescriptive precise, exact uh, definition of what the problem is, uh, exactly what you need to do to fix that problem. Um, and then also, you know, if, if we go back for a second and we say like, you know, what is, what is this telling us in the first place? It's telling us that there's, there's a non-tier zero resource that has a managed identity assignment to a tier zero service principle. Well, what if it turns out that, you know, this is legit. Like, what if it turns out this is a third-party application that I've that I've created in my environment where, you know, I understand that this automation account is going to be doing these privileged actions. Well, what you can actually do is you can actually add that automation account into your tier zero definition as well. And the next time BHE does its analysis, it will take into consideration what are the connections into the automation account. And it will tell you, somebody who's not tier zero has control of this automation account in some way. And it will tell you what the risk level of that is. So the remediation guide will give you options. Um, it's not opinionated necessarily, and there's flexibility for uh, the recommendation lining up with what your business is actually doing with Azure. Um, so what you'll also get in BHE is over time trends for the entire environment. So we're scoped here to the Azure uh, test environment that we have stood up. You can see over time, the risk level was kind of low. And then uh, between March 19th and April 18th, so over this time span, the risk level actually increased by 40%, which it's sitting at 56% right now. What that number means is that 56% of the principles in the environment have an attack path to tier zero. That's what that number means. We can also see the number of tier zero uh, principles over time, and we can see you know what are our, what are our active attack paths and how those uh, changed over time. We can also dig further in to this data, and so one thing that BHE makes really simple is auditing the privileges against any of these particular objects. So for example, I've selected a AKS managed cluster and I'm looking at the inbound object control for this object. So we can see the different principles, including those principles through a security group delegation that have control, some kind of abusable control of this resource. We have them uh, listed here as well. Uh, we can also see very easily what are the uh, MS Graph app role assignments that are defined uh, you know, from any service principle or any app against Microsoft Graph uh, by finding the MS Graph service principle and then clicking on this uh, item here that says inbound abusable app role assignments. And that will render the graph 
and also give us the list of what those service principles are. Okay. So if you're interested in BHE, you can get a demo at this link right here, bloodhoundenterprise.io slash demo. Uh, I'm going to now pull up the Q&A thing for Zoom and see if there are questions that uh, need to be answered here. Here is a great question from Eric. Eric says, what permissions does Spectre Ops need to handle looking at Azure Resource Manager? How are they applied? I'm really interested in this as looking in ARM requires looking per sub. We have over a thousand subs. Other than by code, we fly blind. So this is great. Really good question. So when we deploy Azure Hound for a Bloodhound Enterprise customer, we request the reader role at the root management group, uh, which will then apply to all of your subscriptions. The reader role is the bare minimum least privileged role that we require in order to collect all this information. Without that, you can't read any of this information. So we need that role. And the reader role also does not give you the ability to read, for example, uh, secrets on key vaults. It only gives you the ability to read the information that we need to, to actually collect this info and, and make these, uh, these risk assessments. Uh, here's another question. This is a great question. It says, do you have or will you be adding storage account access as a way to abuse function apps? Uh, we will be adding that. Um, that was actually part of a community pull request to include storage accounts. Didn't quite make this release, but we will be adding in support for storage accounts in the future. Here's another really good question. It says the implementation of MS Graph is only a start, if I'm not wrong. For now, which percentage of paths are you estimating is covered? This is a fantastic question. So for Azure Active Directory, if I had to say a percentage of the attack paths that we cover for Azure Active Directory, it's, hmm, I would say it's probably somewhere around 80% because we are not tracking any of the hybrid connections yet. So if you're doing password hash synchronization, for example, we don't model that yet. Um, and there are some other like uh, passwordless authentication configurations that we don't model yet, uh, which can enable attack paths. Uh, so for Azure Active Directory, I'd say we're about 80% so far. For Azure RM, the percentage is going to be quite a bit lower because of the number of services in Azure RM and the uh, the fact that Microsoft is adding services to Azure RM all the time. I'm not sure what percentage I would ascribe to that, uh, but I'll, I'll think about that. Here's another great question. Any changes to the data collection and workflow needed or just use Azure Hound as before? The answer here? Just use Azure Hound as before, no change. The only thing you need to be aware of is you need to be on the latest version of Azure Hound uh, in order to collect uh, all of these different object types. Outside of that, you'll be good. A uh, follow-up question here says, does the Azure Hound version 2.0.1 update released two weeks ago include the new collection of primitives shown in the webcast? Yes, it does. So if you're on Azure Hound, 2.0.1, you'll be good. You're, you're going to be up to date with everything I showed here. Here's another great question. It says, is it possible now or will it be later to import data from a Sharp Hound scan to Neo4j slash Bloodhound without explicit use of the GUI? So for Bloodhound free and open source, there is a utility authored by another team, not us, that will translate the Sharp Hound data into Cypher statements and do the ingest for you programmatically. Uh, that's not authored or supported by us, uh, but it is out there. Um, I don't have a link handy. Um, otherwise, in the future, uh, you'll be able to do this. 
you'll be able to do like programmatic data ingest into Bloodhound in a way that we officially support. So you'll you'll be able to do that uh, later this year. This question says, I would be interested to know what Azure event log IDs of those changes to the environment which affect the overall risk score in BHE. The intent would be to train our SIM to automatically notify us. Alternatively, I'd be interested in SIM integrations with BHE. So we do have a Splunk integration for BHE. Um, we are also working on an integration for another SIM. Uh, I don't want to mention it by name yet because it's not quite ready. Um, and then the first part of your question here, the event IDs that correlate to each of these different um, you know, changes. Uh, I do have those enumerated. Um, it's kind of spread out right now, so I don't have them in just like one concise spot. Um, so I will need to get back to you regarding what the specific, I'm sorry, what the specific log IDs are of the different changes that can impact the, uh, the risk score in Azure. Here's another good question. It says, how far along is the Bloodhound slash Bloodhound Enterprise Common Code Base Initiative? Great question. So Sharpound is done. Uh, that is, uh, uh, Sharpound is actually built from one common library for both FOSS Bloodhound and Bloodhound Enterprise. Azure Hound is done. Azure Hound, the client, uh, supports both BHE and FOSS Bloodhound with, with no difference. Um, uh, as far as how it does its data collection, um, it, there is there is a difference with how it does ingestion, but uh, otherwise, you know, Azure Hound is is the same binary across both products. The GUI and the backend we are working on now, and I'm not quite ready to talk about how far along we are with that. I'm not quite ready to talk about when we're expecting to release that. Um, but uh, we are working on it actively. And uh, I will I will provide more information about that uh, later. Got some more questions coming in. It says, will Bloodhound Enterprise have the ability to run queries slash import queries? I feel like it is missing a key piece to run ad hoc queries like the free one. It will have that ability. The reason that we don't have that ability now is because Neo4j is the engine that for FOSS Bloodhound, that's that's the database, that's, that's it. That's where all of the data analysis happens. Uh, the query language that Neo4j accepts when it does its queries, Cypher, um, it is very simple to achieve remote code execution on the Neo4j host through Cypher uh, query injection. So we made a decision early on that the risk of that was too great uh, and the mitigating controls that we would need to put around filtering those queries uh, would be too much of a distraction for us to support that feature for Bloodhound Enterprise. So we made a call. We decided we're not going to support that right now because it's too dangerous for our customers. And mitigate, mitigating that danger uh, was too expensive for us at the time. We have changes coming in the future that will enable that future, or I'm, I'm sorry, enable that feature without the risk of remote code execution on the Neo4j host. So the short answer is yes, Bloodhound Enterprise will have that ability. When exactly it will have that ability, I can't say yet, but it is coming. Got a couple of people who are saying they are interested in the Active Directory course. I think Jeff is actioning those questions. So we'll give it a minute and see if any other questions come in. 
Here's a, here's a good question. It says, on a very large environment, I had some issues with the limit of Neo4j for the community version, even with the great optimization of last release. Have you looked into other types of databases that are more ready to handle the amount of data of Azure? Um, I have to be really careful about how I answer this question. Um, let me say that in the future, the concern with you know, performance in the application for these very large environments will no longer be a problem. So I can't say more right now about the database technology. Um, I apologize for that. I, I hate to kind of, you know, hem and haw and be cagey about that, but the reality is I, I just can't talk about that right now. Another question, database tech timeframe. Um, let's say the time frame for that is this year. I think that's I think that's probably the best uh, that I can say right now is this year. Okay. So I'm just going to hang out and see, you know, what other questions come in. Otherwise, I want to thank everybody for joining this webinar. Uh, the recording for this will be available at the same link if you would like to share that link with your colleagues who, uh, you know, missed the live recording. We have a blog post out that goes into all the details that I talked about on the webinar. We also have a shirt, a limited edition shirt that we are selling. And all of the profits of that shirt will go to charity. And the charity that that will be going to is a charity called the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Here's a question. Any plans or information integrating this with Power BI to give execs friendly reports and dashboards? Great question. So Bloodhound Enterprise is totally API driven. And the fact that it's totally API driven means that the Bloodhound Enterprise GUI is an API client, you know, for those API endpoints. We have dashboards, we have charts, uh, we have stats in BHE that, you know, are kind of, you know, tailor-made or, or designed for an executive audience to, to understand what the product is, is talking about um, and, and to deliver information that's valuable to them. Because it is an API-driven application, it is pretty simple to spin up your own API client. And we have examples with how to do that with, uh, with Python, for example. You can do that with Power BI as well. So Power BI will let you connect to an API. And you know, we have examples of how to do the authentication for BHE. And you, know, you can create a, an API client um, uh, in BHE that, that can be authenticated by Power, by Power BI. I'm sorry. You can create a, you can create an identity in BHE for that API client uh, with limited you know readability that uh, can't write anything. Then with Power BI, you can authenticate as that entity against our APIs to uh, create whatever visualization you would like with Power BI or with any other uh, you know business intelligence uh, application. This question says, will you integrate with the digital certificate on all eight escalation paths that exist in a fork Bloodhound version for both free and enterprise? Uh, I might interpret this question as, are we gonna bring Act Active Directory certificate services support to both products? And the answer is yes. So we are working on that. It's um, at the time that the white paper was published, we didn't, we didn't have a way to implement that feature into both products in a way that would allow us to model the configurations and the outcomes of those configurations in a simple user-friendly way. So we have that ability now um, and we are working on incorporating uh, ADCS into both products. I don't have a time frame for you, 
but we are working on it and we will be integrating ADCS into both products. I'm gonna wait a couple more minutes, see what other questions we have. You'll also be getting a follow-up email from us uh, for attending the webinar. And if you have other questions, uh, there'll be information in there about how to, uh, how to reach us. Uh, here's a great question. With regards to permissions, do you recommend or support the free agent to also run under a GMSA? Yes. So uh, with Sharphound, when it's doing its data collection, we absolutely recommend our customers do that with a GMSA. Uh, we recommend it. We support it. Um, I can't say enough good things about GMSAs. Um, as far as how they mitigate the risk of credential theft of um, uh, of credentials being left over in a file share somewhere. Um, the fact that GMSAs can be tied to one computer and they, you know, for the Kubernetes ticket acquisition process, you have to be on that computer. Um, otherwise you can't get a, a TGT. GMSAs are fantastic. Um, and so, yes, we, we support and encourage GMSAs for Bloodhound Enterprise. Another good question. If you have an on-prem Active Directory as well as Azure Active Directory with a limited set of accounts syncing or synchronizing, one way from on-prem to Azure, does Bloodhound correctly assess the one-way paths? The answer right now is no. Uh, so right now, the products don't uh, model any of those synchronization actions at all. However, they will in the future. And that is something that I'm personally working on is modeling the different connections that are possible between on-prem and Active Directory. Uh, this question says, can we also kill the NTLM hardening for free? Not, I'm not quite sure what that means. Oh, it says the enterprise version also supports NTLM hardening by not sending, or was it allowing NTLM authentication? Can we do that on the free version? Uh, you can, so you would need to do this. Uh, so Sharpound, Sharpound itself doesn't control whether it will do NTLM authentication or not because of, because of how we interface with the Microsoft APIs. Um, so in order to do this, uh, you know, NTLM risk mitigation. We we do that through group policy settings on the computer that Sharphound is installed on for Bloodhound Enterprise. And so you can definitely do that with the free version as well, um, but it has to be done through group policy or otherwise it, it has to be controlled by the computer that Sharphound is running on. Sharphound itself doesn't have any control over that. Time frame for the synchronization modeling. Um, the best I can say is this year. And then I see a question there that I'm pretty sure Jeff can answer. We've got a few more minutes remaining. So uh, get your questions in. Uh, this question says, when you do session enumeration from, for Bloodhound Enterprise, what specific API you're pulling there? I believe it's network station user enum, I believe, uh, but I would need to validate that. Um, off the top of my head, it's network, like net WKSTA enum. I think that's what we use for session enumeration, uh, but I would need to validate that.
Yeah, Stephen Stephen Hink says yes. It's net net WKSTA user email. That's right. Here's a good question that says, while using Bloodhound and Kali Linux, after setting up all the things like Neo4j console and everything and adding test JSON data, I'm not getting output. So I would highly recommend that you do not use the version of Bloodhound that is pulled from the Kali repo. Um, it's usually out of date and you run into problems like what you're describing here. So what I would recommend is instead of using, uh, if, if, you, if you're pulling from the Kali uh, repo, instead of doing that, pull from us, pull from our GitHub repo where we have the latest version published. If that fixes your issue, great. Um, if not, um, it depends on what you mean when you say you're not getting any output. You might be getting like a white screen when you start the application, um, or you might be getting a different problem, so it'll depend. This question says, to stop the bad guys from using FOSS Bloodhound like Cobalt Strike, are there any telltale detections? So there are, um, I think probably the most high fidelity detection you would be able to write would be, you know, large LDAP traffic uh, from one LDAP client. Um, I think that would be a great detection, which would catch not only Sharphound doing its data collection, but any other tool that is doing LDAP uh, collection. That's gonna be that's gonna be pretty high fidelity because. There are different ways to enumerate LDAP. There are different protocols that you can encrypt the traffic. Uh, however, the, the system being Bloodhound, it needs data. That data comes from LDAP. So if you can write a, a detection to find you know, loud LDAP talkers or you know, LDAP clients that are collecting a lot of data, that's going to be very, very high fidelity uh, uh, for you to catch somebody doing data collection for on-prem active directory for Bloodhound. This question says, on the free agent, there is a loop setting. What is the longest, safest value there? Um, hmm. That's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. I'll, I'll need to think about that question. I think this might be a clarifying comment regarding the Cali question that says it is showing data error, but not showing any data. Hmm. Uh, so what I would recommend is open an issue on our GitHub repository, include as much detail as you can about what you're seeing. And that is going to be the best place where we will be able to help troubleshoot that issue. This question says, any chance to get on the beta test list for some of the upcoming new features in BHE, like storage accounts, synchronization, our BHE purchase should be going through shortly. Uh, Stephen Hink, maybe you can answer that question um, if you see that question there. Uh, here's another follow-up that says, similar to detecting Sharp Hound, how might we detect Azure Hound? So, um, yeah, this is going to be a lot harder because the Azure APIs that serve the data that Azure Hound collects, uh, what, I, what do I want to say here? It's, uh, yeah, um, let me answer this question offline. Um, there is there are some things that I need to um, verify whether I'm allowed to say publicly or not. Um, so I'll, I'll need to think about this. I'll, I'll need to think about how to answer this in a public forum and, and then get back to you. This says, uh, this question says, this new version of Bloodhound does not bring anything to on-prem AD. Though, do you plan on releasing a new version of Sharpound to fix, for example, the domain trust bug that's been around for a while? So that domain trust bug, depending, uh, I, I believe it's fixed. Um, I would need to verify with Rohan 
whether uh, whether that is fixed. Um, I don't know if Rohan is on here or not, but I believe it is fixed. Uh, Stephen Hink uh, has a follow-up to the question regarding beta features, I think. He says, when we have the opportunity for participation in beta trialing of functionality, we will reach out to customers through release notes, in product notifications, and through conversations with your TAM, your technical account manager. Cool. Thank you, Stephen, for, uh, for that info. Okay. So we are at the top of the hour. Uh, another, another point from Steven says, make sure I plug the Bloodhound Slack. So the Bloodhound Slack, maybe one of our other panelists can put the link to the Bloodhound Slack in the follow-up email or in the webinar chat. A um, couple other things. Uh, we will be at RSA next week. Uh, showing Bloodhound Enterprise. So if you're going to be at RSA, come check us out. We're going to have a booth. We'll be there. Let's see if I missed anything else. I don't think so. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your time. We'll send a follow-up email. I have all kinds of good info. There's the link in the chat for the Bloodhound Slack. Thank you. We'll have that link in the, in the follow-up email as well. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining. Thank you for spending your time with us and goodbye.